Will you state your full name? Julius Streicher. Meine Hände ist viel! Lass der Jude sterben! Streicher's incitement to murder and extermination at the time when Jews in the East were being killed under the most horrible conditions clearly constitutes persecution on political and racial grounds. Gab es außer Ihrem Wochenblatt, insbesondere seit dem Machtantritt der Partei, noch andere Presseerzeugnisse in Deutschland, welche die Judenfrage in judengegnerischem Sinne behandelten? Antisemitische Presseerzeugnisse gab es in Deutschland durch Jahrhunderte. Es wurde bei mir zum Beispiel ein Buch beschlagnahmt von Dr. Martin Luther. Dr. Martin Luther säße heute sicher an meiner Stelle auf der Anklagebank, wenn dieses Buch von der Anklagevertretung in Betracht gezogen würde. Luther as a God-centered man. So here's a man that was absolutely used by God. A great preacher of the Bible. Martin Luther is one of the shining lights that has brought transformation to the church. Church, 15th and 16th century, was both a theological religious institution, but it was also a state. Pope at that time was head of the Medici dynasty. The level of corrupt was immense. Bald das Geld im Kasten klingt, die Seele aus dem Fegefeuer springt. He used the indulgence to bring money. Das natürlich That was something that really struck him, what made him angry. Jesus Christus will, dass das ganze Leben der Christen eine Buße sei. Luther says often that the gospel always has an enemy. Ja, es ist ähm, sehr bedrückend und sehr äh, schlimm, was Martin Luther hier formuliert. The Jews are the first and the perennial enemy of the gospel for Luther. He was a man filled with rage toward the Jewish people. Dass man ihre Synagogen oder Schulen mit Feuer anstecken und das nicht verbrennen, mit Erden überhäufe und überschütte. Not only that, you know, it's impossible to convert the Jews, they will never be converted because that's got punishment for them. Zum anderen, dass man auch ihre Häuser des Gleichen zerbreche und zerstöre. Forbid Jews to utter the name of God publicly. And this is horrible. If the Christians would not expel the Jews from the land, the last day God would punish the Christians. Best thing was to drive them out like the French, the English, the Spanish have done so, and to be without them. Dass man die Juden das Geleit und Straße ganz und gar aufhebe. Not possible to be more offensive to my people. They used Luther for their political ideology. Nazism was able to thrive and prosper in Germany because of the foundation that Martin Luther had laid. The overall message of the Nazis was Luther is great because he was an anti-Semite. Today on Jerusalem Dateline, the girl who went from raising money for school books to raising money for an army. She was very effective because she spoke from the heart. 
because she knew how to relate to the people. We feature the Iron Lady of Israel, Golda Meir, on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Today we bring you a special program taken from The Hope, CBN's documentary on the creation of the modern state of Israel. In the days leading up to Israel's independence, Jewish leader David Ben-Gurion faced opposition on all sides. The Americans refused to support a Jewish state. The Arabs threatened war. And even Ben-Gurion's own cabinet was divided. Israel's only chance for peace with the Arabs now rested on a former school teacher from Wisconsin, a woman Ben Gurion would later call the best man in his cabinet. Certainly, she was one of the founders of Israel, one of the makers of Israel. In many respects, she was one of Ben Gurion's chief lieutenants. An amazing woman, in many respects, a woman of enormous contradictions. She could be wonderful, she could be charming, she could be charismatic, she could be very friendly and very solicitous. She could be, on the other hand, rigid, inflexible, difficult, opinionated, combative, argumentative. I suppose this is what makes a great leader. Golda Mabowitz was born in Kiev in 1898. When she was eight years old, her family moved to America to escape the massacres that ripped through the Russian Empire. They settled in Milwaukee, a city with a thriving Jewish community. But even in America, life wasn't easy. She did not have a good childhood. She grew up in a house with women. There was no man. Her father went to America a few years before they joined him. And there was enormous amount of bickering and arguments and shouting and yelling. And this taught Golda, first of all, a lot of patience. It also taught her something else. If you can arrange things quietly, do so. Even at 11, Golda had a gift for politics. When she found out there were children in her school who were too poor to buy textbooks, she decided to help. Golda talked the manager of a local concert hall into letting her use the hall for free. And one night, she and her friends held a fundraiser where Golda pleaded with the audience to help. That night, they raised enough money to buy textbooks for every student at the school. She was very effective because she spoke from the heart, because she knew how to relate to the people. And turned out she was a fabulous fundraiser, incidentally, all her life. Young Golda was both ambitious and adventurous, traits that didn't sit well with her parents. There was a big argument in the family. She wanted to go to high school. And the family said, no, what for? What do you need high school? Find yourself a job. Until the time comes, you'll find the right man to marry and raise a family. At just 15 years old, Golda took matters into her own hands. She ran away from home and went to live with her sister in Denver. There she learned about Zionism for the first time. And soon the idea of living in the land of Israel consumed her. It was also in Denver that she met her future husband. In Denver, she met Morris Marson, who I remember was a very decent man and they fell in love. He opened to her the world of literature and music and theater, things that she'd never had at home. After two years, Golda returned home to Milwaukee, where she finished school. Then she went to work as a teacher. She also agreed to marry Morris Meyerson, whose name she would later change to the more Hebrew-sounding Meir. Tragedy was that she conditioned the marriage on two things. We're going to immigrate to Israel. We're going to live in a kibbutz. 
He hated both ideas. He was not a Zionist. And she dragged him basically to Israel. In 1921, the couple settled here at Kibbutz Merhavia in the Jezreel Valley. Life was hard, but Golda thrived on the physical labor. She picked almonds, planted trees, and became an expert in raising chickens. She also revolutionized the community's kitchen, where the other women refused to work. They felt kitchen work was beneath them and demanded the same jobs the men were doing. I couldn't understand for the life of me what all the fuss was about. Why is it so much better to work in the barn and feed the cows rather than in the kitchen feeding your comrades? No one ever answered this question convincingly. So I remained more concerned with the quality of our diet than with the feminine emancipation. Her husband Morris, however, didn't share her love for life on the kibbutz. He contracted malaria, so Golda agreed to move with him to Jerusalem. To help pay the bills, she took a job in the Jewish labor union and rose quickly through the ranks. But while her career flourished, her marriage fell apart. They never divorced. They separated. They lived apart. They tried to revive the marriage by having children. That did not exactly work. But they remained very good friends. And he was involved in uh, raising the children. And she became involved in politics uh, since around 1922, 23. And she was in politics in Israel for 50 years. In the trade union movement, in the Jewish agency, the government of Israel, Labor Party, one of the founders of Labor Party. By the mid-1930s, Golda was part of the inner circle of David Ben-Gurion, who would become Israel's first prime minister. He saw her as one of his trusted lieutenants. They disagreed once over issue of partition, 1937. The British offered some sort of partition. He said, take it. Take what you're offered as a chance to save Jews in Germany. She and others said, no, we were promised the whole of the country, let's stick to it. Years later, she had the decency to say we were wrong, and he was right. After World War II, one of the Jewish agency's biggest priorities was helping Holocaust survivors get into Palestine, a goal that was blocked by the British at every turn. Coming up, after the war, Jews across Europe struggle for survival. How Golda Meir made sure tens of thousands survived. After World War II, Jewish refugees from across Europe wanted to come to Israel. But just like before the war, the British blocked them from coming in. With tens of thousands on the edge of extinction, Golda Meir took on the task of winning their freedom from a refugee camp. By the end of 1947, more than 40,000 Jewish refugees were being detained in British camps in Cyprus. Hundreds of infants were not expected to survive the coming winter or the outbreaks of typhus. So Meir went to Cyprus to negotiate their release. The camps were more depressing than I had expected. At one camp, a few tiny little children came up with a bouquet of paper flowers for me. I've been given a great many bouquets of flowers since then, but I've never been as moved as I was by those flowers presented to me in Cyprus by children who had probably forgotten, if they ever knew, what real flowers look like. Golda also requested that in addition to the babies, the camp's older orphans be released as well. At first, the British officer in charge hesitated, then suddenly changed his mind and agreed. 
I couldn't understand why he had surrendered so quickly. But later, I learned that he had received a telegram from his superior in Jerusalem. Beware of Mrs. Meyerson. She is a formidable person. Shortly after Meir's visit, the United Nations voted to divide Palestine into two states, an Arab one and a Jewish one. From that moment, the countdown was on. Within six months, the British would leave, the Jews would declare a state, and the Arabs would declare war. Ben-Gurion called a meeting with his top military leaders. He said to them, we are going to declare the state of Israel. I need from you the list of what weapons you will need because we're going to have a war. And he gave them a couple of hours to come back and they came with the list. And he gave, they gave him a piece of paper. On the piece of paper, there was rifles, machine guns, pistols, grenades. So he took the piece of paper, threw it back to them and says, gentlemen, we are going to war. I need a list of how many tanks you need, how many battleships you need, how many planes you need, how many cannons you need. They all looked at each other. They got up, you know, like the, 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 head, the teacher just smacked the students there. And uh, they went out and they said, when they got to the corridor, they all say, Ben Gurion is Ben Gurion went crazy. Crazy? We are talking about pistol, he's talking about battleships. We are talking about bullets, he's talking about cannons. But he knew what he's talking about. We were, of course, totally unprepared for war. We needed weapons urgently, if we could find anyone willing to sell them to us. But before we could buy anything, we needed money, millions of dollars. And there was only one group of people in the whole world that we had any chance of getting these dollars from, the Jews of America. Most of the council members thought Ben-Gurion should go to the U.S. to raise funds. But Golda had a different idea. I will go. I'm fluent in English and I know how to speak to Americans. And we can't spare Ben-Gurion right now. He is needed here. I can do it. Fine. She knew exactly what would, I hate to use the term, turn them on. Somebody said she appeared to us like Deborah the prophetess, fighting Israeli. And uh, she was very good in the two languages they understood, Yiddish and English. The Jewish agency's treasurer was convinced that they wouldn't be able to raise more than seven or eight million. But after just six weeks, Golda returned from the States with $50 million. That's 1948 dollars. Today it would be, I don't know, billions of dollars. And that paid for weapons that uh, Israel bought from Czechoslovakia, which helped win the 1948 war. Her fundraising accounted, I imagine, for about a third of the costs of the 48 war. Now, few Israelis remember that. But the one who did remember was Ben Gurion, and he cited this on a number of occasions. Ben-Gurion soon had another job for Golda, a diplomatic visit to King Abdullah of Jordan. She had already had one secret meeting with Abdullah seven months earlier. At the time, he had promised her that he would not go to war against the Jews. There were reports that despite his promise to me, Abdullah was about to join the Arab League. Was this indeed so? I asked him in a message. The reply from a man was swift and negative. He asked me to remember three things, that he was a Bedouin and therefore a man of honor, that he was a king and therefore doubly an honorable man, and finally, that he would never break a promise made to a woman. But we all knew differently. When Jerusalem Dateline returns, facing down King Abdullah, how this Jewish woman went head to head with an Arabic leader.
With less than a week to go before the British left Palestine, Jewish leaders needed assurances that Jordan's king would not attack if they declared statehood. What followed was one of the most remarkable negotiations in history, a Jewish woman meeting face to face with an Arab king. The British informed us that it would be a good idea if somebody goes and talks to Abdullah, because he's had a change of heart. Golda requested another meeting. This time, Abdullah insisted that she go to Oman, adding that he would take no responsibility for her safety. She was dressed up as an Arab woman. Among those who dressed her up was my mother went to Haifa and drove with one man to Jordan. Changed cars near the border in a car driven by one of the retainers of the king. And they went to Amman. This is four days before independence. She was a very brave woman in this respect. Abdallah was very upset. He didn't like the idea of the Jews sending a woman. And later on, he argued he didn't understand understood very well. Your Majesty. Mrs. Mercer. Please sit down. Thank you. Your Majesty, have you broken your promise to me after all? When I made that promise, I thought I was in control of my own destiny. Now, I'm only one of five nations. Why are you in such a hurry to proclaim your state? What is the rush? Well, Your Majesty, we've waited 2,000 years for a state. I hardly think that can be described as a hurry. Don't you understand that we are your only allies in the region? What can I do? It's not up to me. Well, you must know that if war is forced upon us, we will fight. And we will win. Why don't you wait a few years? Drop your demons for statehood. I will take over the whole region, and you'll be represented in my parliament. I will treat you very well, and there will be no war. Do you know how hard we've worked? Do you think we did all that just for a seat in a foreign parliament? Your Majesty, if you can offer us nothing more than that, then there will be war, and we will win it. And perhaps we can meet again. After the war. Shalom. Assalamu alaikum. I never saw Abdallah again. Coming up, the deadline for statehood looms large, but so does the prospect of war. See how Ben-Gurion's cabinet reached its historic decision. Golda Meir's visit to King Abdullah had failed. She knew that if Israel's leaders declared statehood, they face war. It's a message she dreaded to deliver to Ben-Gurion's cabinet. The next morning, there was a meeting, and I knew that Ben-Gurion would be there. When I entered the room, he lifted his head and looked at me. I sat down and scribbled a note. It didn't work, I wrote. There will be war. 
Within two days, the final decision had to be made. Ben-Gurion called in two Haganah leaders for a final military assessment. Their answers were virtually identical and terrifying. What is the current strength of the Haganah? We have 35,000 trained fighters, but less than 20,000 of them are fully armed. And as of right now, the tanks and planes we purchased have still not arrived. And the Arabs? If Abdullah added his army, they can be 100,000. And all of them armed and trained by the British. Your assessment? We can only be sure of two things. On May 15, the British will pull out and the Arabs will invade. And then? The best thing I can tell you is we have a 50-50 chance. We are as likely to win as to lose. On that bright note, it was decided by a vote of six to four. On Friday, May 14, 1948, the Jewish state would be declared. Israel would be born with five Arab armies surrounding it, poised for attack. You can learn more about Israel's historic founding and its fight for survival. Go to the HOPE page at CBN.com. That's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.